Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the panelists and to all of the attendees. You're all very welcome. Uh, this is the 12th International Dementia Conference. I'm going to be running today and tomorrow uh, in this new Zoom format. My name is Kim Tully, and I'm the interim uh, CEO of Engaging Dementia, while Sinead uh, takes a year to get her master's in psychology. Sinead and I will be co-hosting the conference this year. And I'm your host for today in this session. Um, at this three-day event, uh, we're going to have more than 40 speakers from Ireland and abroad. We're also going to have a mini symposium from the Global Brain Health Institute. That's later this afternoon, if you look on your program. And a policy and practice forum hosted by Dementia Research Network of Ireland and the HSC National Dementia Office. That's going to take place on Wednesday but you can find a link to sign up for it on our conference webpage. I'd like to welcome and thank our academic partner, Professor Kate Irving at the School of Nursing, Psychology and Community Health, Dublin City University, and all the other members of our con conference advisory panel, the HSC National Dementia Office, the Dementia Services Information and Development Center, Nursing Homes Ireland, the Global Brain Health Institute, the Dementia Research Network of Ireland, and the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. And we'd also like to thank our sponsor, Home Instead Senior Care, with a particular welcome to Richard Mullins. Um, I'd just like to say a few words about engaging dementia. For more than 25 years, we have brought training, advice, and support to caregivers in both residential care and community settings. Our mission is to facil facilitate engagement and connection for people with dementia and their caregivers through education, resources, and community activities. Our vision is an Ireland in which people with dementia and their carers and families are living full life to the full. Our activities are focused on improving well being for people with dementia through the use of music, sensory interventions, the outdoors, the creative arts and evidence-based therapeutic activities. We are also involved in community activities and have recently established an Irish Dementia Cafe Network in a project commissioned by the National Dementia Office. The SONUS program is our core program, a particular welcome to the several hundred SONUS program licensed practitioners nationwide who have been working hard to carry out SONUS sessions and other therapeutic activities with people with dementia throughout the COVID-19 crisis. 2020 has been an extraordinarily challenging time for people with dementia and their care partners. At our conference this year, we will be covering many aspects of care and services and facilitate a sharing of knowledge, best practice and innovation. The full program is on our website at engagingdementia.ie. So there are two virtual rooms today. There's a plenary and then there's a parallel session. You're currently in a session in the parallel session. You will have received links for both. Uh, it's the same link all day. So you can use the same link or go use the link to go to the other session. <laughs> Click on the session of your choice. We're also going to be recording all of the sessions today and tomorrow. And we'll be having them put up on the Engaging Dementia YouTube channel in the coming weeks. We'll send out a communication to everybody when that is all ready. Um, so that is what I wanted to say to kick off the conference. Um, I'm going to have Laura O'Philbin, she's going to be chairing this session. So I'm now going to turn it over to Laura. Thanks a million, Kim, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the day, which is research and practice. So we're going to have three key presentations from a range of speakers from both Ireland and abroad. So it should be a really excellent session. So I'd just like to kick things off. Um, so we'll speak, first of all speak with Dr. Charlotte Stoner, a lecturer in psychology at the University of Greenwich. And Charlotte's going to chat about engagement and positive psychology um, as an outcome measure. Thank you very much. So let me just share my screen. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see this. So I, um, as Laura said, I'm a lecturer in psychology at the University of Greenwich in London. So I'm here today to talk about two outcome measures that I developed, which I actually developed as part of my PhD a couple of years ago. Um, so these outcome measures are the engagement and independence in dementia questionnaire, 
and also the positive psychology outcome measure. So positive psychology, which is what these measures are, are based on, as a term has been around for quite some time. So positive psychology was actually coined by Abraham Maslow in the 1950s. And what Maslow and other humanist psychologists felt was that psychology was a slightly strange discipline in that we'd done a lot of uh, research and we'd, we'd done a lot of um, looking into the downsides of, of life and human well-being. So we've looked at illnesses, we've looked at um, risk factors, but actually we were also, we also could be interested in this whole other area, the positives, looking at the virtues, aspirations. And he um, said that it was like psychology had voluntary, voluntarily confined itself to only half its rightful jurisdiction. And that's a really good way of thinking about positive psychology. It's a, an attempt to balance the narrative slightly. So instead of just being concerned with um, illness and disorder, we also want to look at well-being and and positive and things that can lead to well-being too. Positive psychology, as a kind of distinct branch of psychology, was reintroduced in 1998, and it was reintroduced by Martin Seligman in his um, address as the uh, president of the American Psychiatric Association. So, as a scientific discipline, we say that positive psychology is the study of positive emotions and character traits that enable communities and organisations to thrive. This approach, I feel, is of particular relevance to psychology, and you can really quickly illustrate why it's so important with a Google search. So on the left hand side is a simple Google image search for person with dementia, and on the right hand side is again a simple Google search for older adult. And you can see the difference between these results is quite striking. On the left, we've got people who are looking you know, quite subjective, they're all often on their own, there's even a lady with a, a black eye, and indeed the only real positive image on that left hand side is um, on the top right of Wendy Mitchell, who um, some people may know is a dementia activist, she's living with Alzheimer's disease. On the right hand side, by quite a contrast, are older adults in groups, they're all, they're all happy, they're all laughing, and so you can really see why thinking about positive emotions that can contribute to well-being might be of relevance to older adults living with dementia because these, Im this Im these images on the left really show us the stereotypes that still exist and particularly I'm sure many of you are aware the um, media images of the head clutches are still really quite prevalent despite all the efforts we've gone to in recent years to change the narrative about living well with dementia. So this is where my work came in. I was very interested in looking at these positive things that could help people with dementia retain and maximize their well-being. So I did some informal consultations and then later on a qualitative study to identify some key positive emotions or positive traits that were of particular relevance to people living with dementia. And what we discovered was that things like being hopeful and remaining hopeful was a very um, key part of maintaining well-being for people with dementia, and also resilience and active resilience. Um, previously, when we thought about resilience and dementia, it was very much in this kind of negative coping, um, negative coping way, where we said that you kind of you have to minimise the losses, and that was a form of coping. But now we're really thinking about living well with dementia and resilience is being able to bounce back from a perhaps a stressful experience. Also which of particular relevance was feeling independent and also feeling engaged with those around you. So I on his mobile and say, how are you Nan? Nan? It, you know, it's lovely. So really talking about social engagement with those around you. There was also decision making, because I like to make decisions for myself. In a lot of places, it's all right. But as I said earlier on, it's not with some people. And then we've also got more social engagement. Oh, yeah, it does mean a lot to me to be able to talk to people. It means a lot to be able to, uh, means a lot to me when I can express myself. So this led me and in particular thinking about independence, the hope and resilience concepts were 
fairly standard with what we know in the literature. But this independence and social engagement I found to be really complex and influenced by all these kind all these variables that made up what we might think of as interdependence. And this is very much about people with dementia recognizing that they were perhaps not able of living as independently as other people, but with a little bit of support, they were able to maintain a level of independence that they were capable of and desirous of. And this obviously depend, uh, differed depending on the person. Some people wanted a great deal of independence, whereas others were quite comfortable with um, their family or their carers taking over aspects and taking over roles. So it's a very interdependence in, from what I could get from this qualitative study, was very individualistic. It was tied up in social engagement and particular things like reciprocity. People with dementia recognised that the people around them did lots of things for them, took over roles, perhaps finance was a particular one. And they recognised that other people were doing this for them and they had a real desire to give back in any way possible. Connectedness, they had a real desire to maintain engagement with people around them. In particular, this was family and grandchildren, but it also was in reference to activities and social activities that they had previously been involved in. When we think of independence, there was very much the classical functional independence, which is where a lot of the literature on independence in dementia is at the moment. And this is very much self-care oriented. I can um, make myself lunch, I can um, dress myself, those sort of things. And that was definitely in there, but it was actually a very small part of a much broader concept. It was tied up in also remaining active, and this could be remaining active physically, also remaining active mentally, engaging in quizzes or, um, or hobbies like gardening. And what could really affect levels of independence was this relationship between the person with dementia's perception of their own ability, a carer or a significant other's perception of that ability and their actual ability. If those three concepts were in alignment, it was a definite facilitator of independence. But if there was a mismatch, so for instance, if a person with dementia's perception of their ability was that they could do much more than a carer felt they were otherwise capable of, that could be a real barrier to someone feeling independent. So this led me to develop something that we called the engagement and independence in dementia questionnaire. And so I developed this measure, it was 26 items, and then we needed to test out the psychometric properties to make sure that it was a valid and reliable measure for older adults with dementia. And we did this in a study um, mainly based in England with 225 people. Uh, sorry, it was a pilot study with 17, and then we checked the psychometric properties and then went on to further evaluate it with 225 people. What we found was that there was some really quite good psychometric properties. We found that there was um, excellent internal consistency we found that it was moderately stable over a one week period. We found that there was quite significant correlations with some of these established concepts that we tend to measure in dementia. So we found that particularly with quality of life, there was a significant relationship between feeling independent, social engagement and quality of life. And we also found the inverse of that. We found a negative relationship with depression. So people who were more likely to meet the criteria for clinical depression but also less likely to feel engaged with those around them and to feel independent. And that, um, that statistic goes a little bit further. So people who met the criteria for depression were significantly score, were scoring significantly less on the EQ. So for people who were depressed, they scored about 57. And for people who were not depressed, that was 84. So quite a significant difference. And what this tells us is that these concepts previously unstudied are really important for some of the classic concepts like quality of life and depression. And by intervening on one, we may be able to vicariously have a benefit in the other. So if you can improve people's feelings of social engagement and independence, you might see a reduction in depression, which is obviously a really valuable thing to be intervening on um, and to do. The second measure, that we developed was the positive psychology outcome measure. So this was more um, a classic measure of hope and resilience. 
And again, like with the EQ, we found these really significant um, relationships and also these good psychometric properties. So we found that there was excellent internal consistency. We found that it was moderately stable over a one week period. And again, we found these relationships with both quality of life and depression. So a positive relationship between hope, resilience, and quality of life, and a negative relationship between hope, resilience, and depression. And again, we found that went a little bit further and the people who were um, more likely to be depressed were scoring significantly lower on these measures. Again, suggesting that if we were able to develop hope fostering and resilience building interventions, we might see a subsequent improvement for people who are feeling depressed or people who have a low quality of life. I also did some structural equation modeling and this is because there is a concept in the literature called flourishing. And this is a positive psychology um, concept. And flourishing is defined as a person's ability to live well and achieve an optimal level of functioning characterized by positive relationships, positive emotions, resilience, mastery, and growth. And whilst I didn't cover all of those concepts within my measures, we have got positive relationships and positive emotions and resilience. So what I did was I, um, in my structural equation modeling software, I mapped my measures, so hope, resilience, independence and engagement, onto a flourishing factor. And what I found that what I found was that these measures combined led to were associated with a greater quality of life. So again, these um, concepts that were previously unstudied really have a story to tell about quality of life and um, flourishing as we know it in positive psychology. My conclusions from this study were that quite obviously people with dementia retain and actively use these character strengths and positive emotions to maintain or, or enhance their own well-being. And I say obviously because it, it almost goes without saying, we know that people with dementia are using these things. We've seen it in the qualitative literature and we know it anecdotally from um, maybe people we've come into contact with. But without quantitative measures, it's really hard to evidence these things in a, in a um, quantitative study. So from my study, we can see quantitatively that people are using these, um, these positive concepts and they're really highly related to quality of life and depression and probably many other things. We just need more research to back this up. We found that independence is multifaceted. And by that, I mean that it has, um, it's not just functional independence as we tend to study it in dementia. It's about remaining active. It's about um, being engaged with those around you and being um, and feeling reciprocity and, and connectedness. Using best practice psychometric theory, so um, in the development study we had consultations with people with dementia, we um, did a qualitative study, and we then did an in-depth psychometric study and structural equation modeling. We developed these two positive psychology outcome measures. And these measures had really good psychometric properties, including that evidence of a flourishing factor when combined. Um, so I think I've actually gone a lot quicker. I did have 20 minutes. Uh, apologies, I think I might have sped up as I went through. And um, these are the references associated with the measures. Um, so there was the develop development study and then two published papers talking about the psychometric properties um, and the factor analysis. And I would be remiss not to thank my project partners. The study was, um, uh, it was funded by UCL as a PhD and was part of the Promoting Independence and Dementia Project. And the NHS Trust that ran that large study, Derbyshire, uh, North East London, Nottinghamshire, Black Country and Humber. So that's me done. Thank you very much for listening. If you want to use the measures in your service, they're free to use. Um, I'd love to hear how you get on with them. So just drop me an email and they, you can use them to evaluate any of your research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlotte. That was very interesting. Um, so I'm now going to bring Laura back. Thanks so much, Kim. And Charlotte, thank you so much. That was so interesting. I always find it so remarkable when someone can do really kind of complicated work with like 
modeling and, and all this stuff and then drill it down into a presentation that you know we can all understand and we can all take something from so that was that was really interesting and I was so um struck about the what you said about um how people are impacted by the perceptions of others so you know we all need to buy in for a person to be able to feel a sense of independence it's not just about them we all need to augment that by by buying into it so thank you that was really really interesting um, I think that Kim, as far as I'm aware, the Q and A is that that's at the end. So um, we'll move on to our our next session. So that actually involves three speakers. So we have um, Ms. Marguerite Keating, and Marguerite is a member of the Irish Dementia Working Group. Um, Cloda Whelan, and Cloda is the Advocacy, Engagement and Participation Officer at the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland, and also Dr. Fiona Kyo, who is a Senior Research Fellow for the Economic and Social Research on Dementia at the Centre for Economic and Social Research on Dementia at NUIG, and they're going to talk about their collaborative approach to developing um, guidelines called Hear Our Voice. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, I'm going to begin um, the session today and I introduce Marguerite, who's a member of the Irish Dementia Working Group, and she sits on the steering group of, of the Irish Dementia Working Group. So that's a committee of people living with dementia who steer the work of the group. And what I think is particularly interesting um, for our presentation coming after Charlotte's is that perception of, of what people living with dementia can and cannot do and, and what kind of a life they can live. And I think Marguerite is a really good example of how vibrant that life has, has potential to be. So I'm wondering, Kim, I'm going to start off the session. I'm going to explain a little bit about what the Hear Our Voice guideline is and why we decided to collaborate and write it. And then we're going to hand over to Fiona Kyo, who collaborated with the Irish Dementia Working Group and the Alzheimer's Society on the document. But if we could spotlight Marguerite so that she's the main person that we're looking at, um, because Marguerite is going to start off by, I suppose, answering a few questions for us. So we created the Hear Our Voice document, but we have to go back and we have to look at why we created it. So Marguerite, just for the people who don't know you, I'm going to ask you, first of all, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, um, well, I was diagnosed at 55 and I was noticing when Charlotte was speaking there, they were talking about older people in with dementia, but um, we had a 39 year old diagnosed last year in Ireland and a uh, 40 year old and I was 55. So it, it's getting younger. So um, it, I think that when people, um, so I'll go back to me. So um, I'm, I, um, I live in Cashel in County Tipperary and I have um, three daughters. One lives in Northern Ireland and one girl is in hospital at the moment. She's just had her sixth baby <laughs> and um, Rebecca, uh, a little boy. And um, I think it should be called Shay because that's six in Irish. <laughs> 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 and um, um then I have Blonard, and Blonard uh, lives here with me, um, and she is uh, she'll be seventeen in February. And I have a partner, James, who lives in Dublin. And um, normal times, we commute up and down to each other. Um, I uh, worked, um, I suppose, in the caring profession. I worked as um, uh, an art teacher. A drama and um, drama teacher in um, the uh, Brothers of Charity, a music teacher for um, just over 20 years. And, and I had um, people that I worked with had uh, were experiencing dementia. Um, many uh, Uh, last Marguerite, time at all. No, that's okay. Marguerite, I suppose what you've painted there is a picture of a really full life. Yeah. And a really full life with children and grandchildren and a job and hobbies and interests and a really full life. 
And then you got diagnosed with dementia. What happened then? Um, well, it was almost like turning off the light. It went from an ordinary life. I was having problems. And I suppose other people were finding it more of a problem than I was. Yes. I was saying, ah, sure, everyone puts their keys in the fridge. Yes. Sure, <laughs> everyone walks out of the house with their slippers on now and yes. again. Yes. Sure, everyone does things like that. And it's because my head, I'm very fast to think. Yes. And I would have been very clever in school. Mm. And so my head would be very fast. Mm. And I kind of thought, you know, I'm getting older and instead of slowing down a bit, I'm still doing this pace. Yes. And that's what's wrong, that I just need to slow down a bit. And, you know, I'm getting a little bit uh, mixed up with things. And this is because I'm too fast. Right. So. Also, I'm an artist and kind of we leave a, um, um, a little bit of leeway for artists out there, a bit <laughs> mad and they're a bit eccentric, you know. Yes, yes. So Marguerite's just a little bit out there, you know, and um, I would always be very happy person. And, you know, they'd slag me at work and say, how do you stay happy all the time? And, and Marguerite, sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to I'm going to keep the show on the road. I know you told me when you got the diagnosis that it was really shocking yeah. and you were told, you know, get your affairs in order and it, mm. it seemed really negative. Yeah. But then you chose to be an advocate and, and you joined the Irish Dementia Working Group. And how did that, that feel then? That very day that I was diagnosed was Valentine's Day. 2019 yes. um, so it's nearly gone on two years now year yes. and a half and I came home here Tina who's my cousin Tina Flanagan I call her Tina Keaton well Tina is very very good to me she's my carer although she's not paid she's not she doesn't get any money for it, but she does my financial things and things that I can't yes. cope with yes. or things that I um, am not sure of. Tina will step in. She keeps all That's of my brilliant. things yeah. all in line for me. So she's there at the end of the phone and she taps in with me a lot. Now, James is very good to me. And so when James is around, Tina has been able to step back a bit. You know, yeah. my well, you came home. So I, sorry to interrupt, Marguerite. You came home and you told Tina about the diagnosis. No, Tina was with me. Oh, okay, right. And we went to um, a little calf and we had breakfast, and I cried all the way through it. Wow. And she had to do her own thing, she was minding um, my cousin's her, her ne nephew, and um. So she had to go off with Charlie, who was only two at the time. And I came home here to a very empty big house. And I sat here and I thought, oh, how am I going to tell them, you know, my family? Mm -hmm. And then I thought, you know, I'm not going to be any use to anybody. And it would probably be better for them if I wasn't here. And that was my first thought. And I wouldn't have su suicidal tendencies but at that time everything just went from me I felt like because I was told um go home get your stuff in order um make sure your affairs uh think about somewhere to live it was like it's happening next week mm. it wasn't like this is down the line it was in you know what's the word it, in a minute imminent in a minute, yeah that's really scary. Yeah, but it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. So I lost my job, if you like, and I lost all my life. It just went like this. But on hindsight, everybody freaked out, not just me. Yes. My doctor, my doctor's very good to me, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like she was writing me off. She was full of fear as well because it was new for a 55 year old. Mm. And it was like, oh my God, get this all sorted out now. Mm. And, you know, it didn't need to be that way. So what happened then when you joined the working group? Well, that day I came back here, Tina was gone. I was thinking about 
what why I was going to kill myself, um, because it wasn't any use to anyone. And then I start, I picked up the folder that was here. Amy Murphy was the dementia advisor. Mm -hmm. She had been here, and I just picked it up, and I said, she said to me, "Ring me anytime." I said, "This is the time you need to ring somebody." Yeah. So I rang Amy. I rang. I couldn't get her. But I rang her, she rang me back. I rang um, the Alzheimer's helpline. Yeah. I rang everybody. And then they said to me, well, you know, um, this isn't like a loss. You hold on there and, you know, there is there is light at the end of the tunnel. You could join and there's a cafe. And that cafe um, in Turles means, means so much to me. Yes. And we sit there and they tell jokes and we have a cake and we have a natter yeah. and I don't know why, but it was the first place I was able to cry and just oh, sit there and cry. Good. I felt like I was in, with my own, I suppose. Mm. I just really burst into tears. I was hegging, I couldn't stop crying. But since then, I've kind of been made feel very, very strong. You know, and when I, James would be very good to monitor me in a way that I can't do myself. Like he'd say to me, okay, you've done enough painting, put it away now because now you need to just chill out. Because if I do too much, I can't think properly or I can't and make can, decisions. Can I, can I move a little bit to the, to the work? So you joined the working group and you, you know, I remember, I remember the first day meeting you in Mitchellstown, you were so yeah. vibrant. First of you December. bring such a sense of, yeah, you bring such a sense of fun and to, to the work and the Irish Dementia Working Group, they do policy consultations, they go to conferences, they go to meetings and you and your colleagues had good experiences and bad experiences. Mm -hmm. And you decided it was time to tell people how to support you. Yeah. And, and I suppose I'm interested to see why you think that's important. Um, I suppose any of us, if you got a knock, if somebody said, um, uh, I don't know, Anything, Jesus, you're very big chest, or you're yes. very heavy, or you're very, Jesus, your skin's bad. Anything like that. It just, you know, yeah. you might, I know exactly how fat I am, or how big I am, or how spotty I am. I don't need anyone to tell me. Yes. But when someone tells you, or, or says it straight away, it's like, and it, it's shocking. Mm. Um, I've lost train of thought now again. No, that's okay. You know, Marguerite, I, I know what you mean. That when you get a knock, you need support to build yourself back up. Yeah. yeah. So when you get the knock that you have just dementia, I mean, dementia is for an 80-year-old lady. Yes. Not for a 55-year-old yeah. in her full prime. Yeah. I dance on the floor all night long and, you know, what? It's joking me. So it, it, and it's happening more and more and more to younger people. So my yeah. kind of thing is don't let them go through what I went through. Like if I'm involved and I'm helping and I'm doing different things, maybe I can say I can help somebody else that felt the same way as I did. Yeah. And that we need to make more things available for younger people with dementia. Because mm. that way, those people will stay well longer. So yes. that you're not talking about um, chronic dementia in, you know, at the end game. And a lot we're of, talking a lot about of our... long time. I, I have to live with this for maybe a good yes. few years, you know. Yes. I don't and plan on going anywhere. Yeah, a lot of our members say that, Marguerite. Yeah. That, that, that doing the advocacy work, giving their opinion, meeting Fiona for a consultation, it keeps them well. You, you said something interesting to me when you were preparing. You, you said, people always ask me how my dementia affects me. So yes. they always want you to tell them the bad stuff. Yeah. They never focus on what you can do. Yeah. 
Yes. Would you like to tell us a bit about that? Which is very, it's ironic in a way because Charlotte's there speaking about how we can, you know, backtrack that and make that better. But yeah. it is what people focus in on. Mm. And what do you forget? What do you do? You know, it's all about the negative things instead of saying, um, oh, you get the train on your own. I get the train on my own. Now, yeah. the first time I did it, I fell and broke my ankle but <laughs> a year ago. I remember that phone call, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, and that could have put me back really far, you know. But um, mm -hmm. the thing is, people do get off the train. There is a lot of hustle and bustle, and I just slipped, you yeah. know, instead of saying, you know, it was my dementia. Not everything's my dementia. Stop you. You didn't let that stop you no. being involved in or going again. No. And I went again on my own. And um, no, I was lucky. I've been very minded. And lots of people have kind of helped me along the way. Um, I meet other people with dementia on the train or, you know, get a lift. And that's been, you know, great help. But now things have changed a little bit. And I have yes. to do those things on my own. Whereas mm. I might have been very scared to do those things. But now I'm like, things happen people every day. It's not because of my dementia. Don't put yes. everything down to my dementia. So, um, and you learn to zoom, like you're zooming now. Yeah, I, and I, I'm, I used to be really good in the computer at work. And then even in work, I was like, oh, what do you push? What do you do? I, my brain cannot handle computers at mm -hmm. all. And um, that's very difficult. When they're talking about doing hubs and different things like that, I find them really, really different, yes. but uh, hard. But nobody sat down with me and said, right, we'll go over it or we'll write it down and we'll keep going, you know, because if I do things over and over again, like I do a quiz every night before I go to bed, on the telly that's a great strategy <laughs> just yeah and, and i love I it can i come in there i think what you've explained very well is that with support people living with dementia can be involved and i think that's really important because we have lots of people joining this session now and i i i hope they've joined because they think gosh i'd love to involve people living with dementia in my work and i want to understand how to do it and I think what we're hearing from you is that we have to focus on what you can do rather than what you can't. And that people living with dementia, like what you said there was a really good example of, we think if someone lives with dementia and something goes wrong, we must stop them doing it ever again. Like you fell after getting the train, but I could fall getting the train. Fiona could fall getting the train. Yeah. And there and is. you did fall around the same I time. I did fall. Yeah, thanks for telling everyone, Marguerite. Yes, I did fall at getting the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, yeah. But But that's, a, that's actually a brilliant example. Nobody's telling me I'm not allowed to get the train anymore. Yeah. And I, I, I attended a conference recently and someone spoke about the dignity in making a mistake, being allowed to make a mistake. And I think you've explained that really well today and also just because someone living with dementia has a certain deficit and a diagnosis doesn't mean they don't have a lot to offer and I know when Fiona speaks she'll chat about what what working with the Irish Dementia Working Group has meant but I would say to anybody watching the presentation today it's so important to involve people living with dementia and to focus on what they can do rather than what they can't. And if you're a bit worried and you're thinking, oh my God, how would I go about that? We have a guidance document all ready to support you. And um, yeah. I think Marguerite, we, we, we might hand over to Fiona now to tell no us- problem how that happened and then you and I will finish up at the end and we have a short video for for the audience as well but we'll hand over to Fiona now to explain how she worked on the document with you and your colleagues thank, thank you for your time and stay with us thank you thank you. okay thanks Cloda and, and Marguerite um I'm going to I just have a few slides um to to share with you so the um 
I mean, Marguerite and Claude have, have kind of described very well, you know, part of the process that, that we were involved in. And as a research centre, I suppose one of our main aims in our work over the last number of years was to really centrally involve um, people with dementia in our work, not just as research subjects, but we wanted them to be involved in, in shaping the research agenda in the design of studies. Uh, how to disseminate findings and, and crucially how we might impact on policy. Um, so that involved a lot of different kind of types of interaction with people with dementia and meetings and consultations and um, attending conferences and things like that. <clears throat> and there was no real template uh, as researchers that we could go to to say, well, this is really the best way to involve people with dementia. And the, these are the kinds of things that you should pay attention to. Um, but we had really good partners with the Irish Dementia Working Group, with, with Marguerite and her colleagues, and with the Alzheimer's Society uh, of Ireland through Cloda and her colleagues. Um, and, and we'd worked together a lot uh, over the last number of years. And we'd learned a lot of the process. And we decided we would try and bring that together into a, a toolkit, if you like, a set of guidelines. Um, and really so that others wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel and that they would have a, a, some guidance or guidelines that they could turn to. If they said, we, you know, we want to bring a group of people with dementia together, what's the best way to do that? So, um, so as I said, there was a lack of guidance out there on, on how best to do this. Um, and particularly in work like policy formulation and policy implementation, there has been a lot of work um, on research and how to best involve people with dementia in research very specifically, but we were looking at all the other activities um, and, and how, we, how best to do that. So we co-produced that, this toolkit, uh, so the members of the working group and ourselves in the centre and the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. And we really wanted to produce some detailed but very practical best practice uh, guidance on involving people with dementia. And you can see the lovely cover of the um, of the guidance here. I know it's partly covered by the uh, the 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 um, bar down the side. This is Marguerite's own artwork, uh, and I think it was a really you know it's a beautiful picture. Uh, and she's got the worker bees here representing the members of the working group. But again, a good example of the many talents and skills of people with dementia that we can bring um, to, the, to the party, if you like. So how we did this, we had a kind of an early scoping meeting. So I met with uh, members of the group um, and we, you know, we kind of discussed what should be in this in terms of topic headings, uh, how, how they wanted it to look, what the flow should be like. You know, we didn't want it too long. We wanted it very focused, very tight. Um, and uh, we had a do, did up a draft then, and we had a meeting with six members of the working group. The first one where we really considered, um, we kind of went through draft headings and we really started to populate, well, we, the, oh, that bit should be there. We should make sure that we talk about um, accessibility in venues. We should make sure we talk about um, how best to interact with people and so on. We had a very kind of brainstorming meeting. And then we had a second draft that um, me members of the group could go through in, in detail and comment on. Um, and in the middle of all of this, uh, as if it wasn't a challenging enough piece of work to do, COVID struck. And um, so the second meeting of the group was virtual and it was one of the first Zoom meetings of the group and it worked really well. Um, so we also learned a lot from that. And then at the last minute said, we better include a section in the guidelines on how to do virtual working with people to mention. So there is a piece in the guidelines on that. We also wanted to just get some other views so the people who support uh, supporters of people with dementia particularly those who are attending these kind of meetings they have their own views on what's particularly helpful uh, so we got their views as well and we were aware that um, organizations like deep the dementia engagement and empowerment project had produced their own guidance documents some very detailed ones um, for example on language on terminology, on filming and things like that. And we didn't want to repeat that. So we've embedded links in our guidance to these really other detailed uh, documents that people can draw on. 
Um, so the, the, the structure of the guidance, when you when you look at it, there's, there's kind of two real sections. The first is a set of principles that really underpin the guidelines. And these, these are, if people even just attended to these, it would make a big difference. Um, and I think Margaret, Marguerite has just embodied there a lot of these in, 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 as she was speaking. Um, it's the, the, the kind of the ethos underneath all of this is about giving the person a voice. Uh, so it's about putting what the person uh, with dementia is, is saying front and centre and seeing the person as a unique individual and supporting their personhood, emphasising their strengths and abilities. So what they can do, not what they can't. Um, working on the basis that participation is a human right, uh, being flexible because um, everybody has good days and bad days. So although you may have set something up uh, for a certain day to work in a certain way, you may need to modify that on the day. And responding to each person as an individual. So while this is guidance um, in general uh, for people with dementia, you know, we need to tailor uh, whatever you do to each participant. The importance of not judging a book by its cover. Um, a lot of participants um, at this meeting and at and many others um, turn up with so much preparation done. They speak very easily and fluidly um, and you even get the kind of, that person doesn't have dementia at all, comments. And, um, you know, that's taken a lot of work and preparation on the, on the part of those participants. Um, so it's important not to just judge by what you're seeing at a, a, a 10 minute presentation. Uh, that could have taken a day actually to get ready. Uh, and the importance then of, of paying attention to safeguarding throughout all of these interactions. The, the guideline areas then, there's 10 areas. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through them in detail because you can access the, the document very easily. Um, but it covers things like um, the, of, of just the basics of interacting with people with dementia, speaking clearly, uh, in terms of communication and um, asking the person what's the best way to communicate with them in terms of arranging meetings, whether it's by text, by phone call, by email and so on. Um, avoiding jargon and in, in, in communications, keeping them clear and concise and so on. And um, in terms of venue, things like accessibility, signposting, um, travel, making sure that um, accidents apart, that, um, you know, you step out each each part of the journey that people know how to not just get to the venue once they're in a the city but where they might park or how to get from a transport hub such as a bus station or train station and so on so a lot of this is about detail 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 because it's those little things actually that can really trip someone up metaphorically not literally marguerite um in in you know and in getting the best from from their participation the importance of, of recognizing the contribution being made and acknowledging that, um, not just uh, with a thank you in terms of, of documents um, and acknowledgement section, but also recognizing the expenses that, that are involved um, and having clear policies on that. And we have a section then on different types of involvement, like um, a meeting as opposed to a conference, as opposed to a, a larger consultation and so on. So they're the general areas of, of the guideline. Um, you know, again, the, 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 as I said, the focus is on, on hearing people's voice. This is a quote from one of the members of the working group. Um, and they describe the importance of the work. Uh, it's taken me to a place I never dreamed possible and also give me a sense of purpose. If I didn't have this group, what would have happened? So the importance of uh, participating and you know, in in uh, as Charles was was mentioning earlier that the the uh, continuing to flourish, uh, even when after diagnosis of dementia, and the importance of this kind of work for many people with dementia in that process. And the guidelines, the aim of the guidelines is to make sure that that is as good as it can be, that participation, that it's fun as well as being useful, um, and that everybody gets something out of it. Um, so we'd really, uh, you know, a fantastic time, I think, putting these guidelines together. And uh, I really want to thank the members of the group and CLODA. Um, we, you know, this work was funded also by, by a grant we had from the Health Research Board. And we want everybody to use these guidelines as much as possible. They're on our website. They're also on the ASI website at alzheimer.ie. And so I'm going to hand it back now to uh, Marguerite and CLODA. 
Thanks very much, Fiona. And I suppose in putting together the guidelines, we lived the guidelines. The, you know, the Marguerite and her colleagues on the working group were our guides. They gave us advice. They told us what worked, what didn't work. And I think that's really important. Um, and, you know, I know, Marguerite, we often talk about, um, you know, what being involved in the group means to a person and the importance of, of involvement and having your voice heard. Because sometimes those of us who are professionals can think that we know best when that always isn't the truth. Um, we have a video to show the work of some of the group uh, to finish up with, but I just wanted to check, Marguerite, there's lots of people watching this video here today and, and attending the Zoom conference who might be thinking, oh, I don't know about involving people living with dementia. What would you say to encourage them? I suppose the most important thing about dementia is it's not it's very individual, yes. you know, it, it, like a cancer. They're yeah. all very individual. You don't know the outcome. You don't know how the process, how it's going to go. So very much when you're dealing with people with dementia, we all need to keep an open mind. And um, I suppose I, I I was thinking of it, my adventure is like um, when you're watching the television, say you're watching what, Netflix, and all of a sudden uh, it goes for a second or it freezes for a second. Yes. When it comes back, it's not worse. It's as good as it was. So oh, yeah. those freezes are just a little glitch. So in, instead of zoning in on the glitch that will happen with me for yeah. a couple of seconds maybe zone like on the painting i can do or you know or yes. i made the christmas cards this year you know the yeah. design of yeah. the christmas card um um sean how he's so very very clever, very astute in um, documenting things, and oh, he's amazing. That's and one of your colleagues Helen, on the working yeah, group. Yeah, we all have our own different, you know, strengths. As is, as does everybody. So just don't put everything down to dementia. But when, when they kind of give it a go, give it a go. Margaret, I'm going to mind. Gonna, I'm going to stop you there because I think. That is a really important message for the people in the audience who give it a go, just try, work yeah. with the person living with dementia. And also for people living with dementia, give it a go, have your voice heard. You know, yeah. I think it will work out really well. Yeah. And we would like to say that we understand that these guidelines are for working with people who are a bit earlier in their dementia. But yeah. we feel that the work of the working group can improve the lives of everyone living with dementia. They advocate for better supports and services for everyone. But what I'm going to do now is just finish with a video. And this video is the work undertaken by the Irish Dementia Working Group in 2018-19. And it shows that if you put the guidelines into action, there is real, as Marguerite's colleague Kevin would say, magic can happen. So yeah. I'm just going to check. Um, Fiona, can you see the screen yeah. okay there? Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. And actually, I'll just make sure my sound is up. Yeah, perfect. No one will love you as you are, but I won't let them break me down to dust. I know that there's a place for us, for we are the Wanna cut me down? I'm gonna send the blood, gonna drown them out. I am brave, I am bruised, I am who I'm meant to be. This is me. Look out, cause here I come. And I'm marching on to the beat I drum. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me.
Birds wanna cut me down. I'm gonna send a bird, gonna drown a mouse. This is brave, this is bruised, this is who I'm meant to be. This is me. <laughs> So that's what you can achieve if you involve people living with dementia. And we really, really hope you will. And please, I'll put my email address in the chat box if you'd like any advice on involving people living with dementia in your project, you can give us a shout. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation, ladies. Thanks so much, um, Clauda, Fiona, and of course, Marguerite. I think that was fantastic. I actually always get a bit emotional watching that video, so I'll try not to. <laughs> To have any tears but um I just think the work is absolutely incredible and I think what really comes across from the presentation is that these guidelines while they're really really important to implement they're actually not that hard like what you have to do isn't a huge amount of extra work or it isn't a huge amount of um additional resources but not doing them has a really detrimental effect so it is really really important to you know have a read see what you think and and as marguerite says definitely just give it a go um, and see see what you can achieve um, also i noticed that there are you know, a good few people watching today so please do feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box have a chat with with other people who are here and of course if you have any questions please um, do ask them and, and we will come to them at the end so next I'm going to move to our final speaker of this morning. So we have Sally Whelan, who's a PhD candidate from the National University of Ireland, Galway. And Sally did a narrative literature review on fostering the resilience of people with dementia. So I'm really looking forward to hearing this. So I'll pass over to you now, Sally. Thank you very much, Laura. And um, thank you to everybody for this opportunity to, um, to share my literature review. I'm gonna try and share my screen now. So I'm Sally Whelan is my name. I'm a PhD student at the University of Galway. And um, thank you for this opportunity to, sh to share with you the results of my literature review, which um, examined how social um, psychosocial interventions um, had been previously investigated and looked into how the resilience of people with dementia can be fostered. So I'll give you a bit of background to the literature review. I needed to know I needed to understand what the optimal content and structure and impact of previous interventions had been um, made of. And I also needed to identify how the concept of resilience had previously been defined and examined in previous investigations. So I conducted a narrative review and searched eight databases for literature published between uh, the year 2000 and uh, 2019 using uh, keywords. Resilience and they um, importantly had to involve people with dementia and they had to focus on psychosocial interventions. Now, as, as part of the narrative review, um, it was important to use a tool to check the quality of the studies that were investigated. And I chose to use the CASP, Critical Appraisal Skills Program tool, um, which is recommended by the World Health Organization. So after um, searching and uh, removing uh, duplicate documents. I had 6,749 articles to, re to look through. And um, after screening their titles and abstracts, I was left with full text 
dif um, different interventions and of which had the aim of promoting um, resilience for people with dementia. So um, most of these interventions involved uh, people who lived in the community and they had mild dementia and they had family caregivers. Um, one of to the dementia care cafes um, that uh, Marguerite was referring to previously. And there was also a memory maker intervention, which was a, a series of um, groups which involved uh, an educational component for people with dementia and their caregivers. Um, and there, there was also a peer group involvement aspect to that intervention. ended the memory maker um, groups. And the, the other intervention was the only one that was organized for people who had moderate to severe dementia and they were living in long-term care. Um, situations. This visual arts enrichment program. Okay, so the resilience pro process framework, it sees resilience as occurring in the presence of stressors such as living um, with dementia with memory problems. And these stressors are impacted by having or not having resources that are um, personal and um, at community level, like having social support that was already mentioned, or at societal level in terms of the culture and the policies that are around. And these, these um, impact resilience through um, an outcome and a response. So I put all the findings, what everything that people um, with dementia had said and their caregivers had said into this framework. And I found that um, Resilience could be supported through these interventions through reducing adversity. Now, particularly people with dementia, like Marguerite was talking about earlier, they mentioned that just their dementia per se that caused them problems. It was actually the stigma of having dementia and their experience of social isolation. One person said, you, you are not alone when you attend the group. I felt the group was a lifesaver. It, it brought a life empowering us all. Resilience could also be impacted through increasing um, both personal and social resources. It was key and it, it, several people mentioned, it was all about creating a stigma-free space and providing activities um, either individually or in groups that supported people's personhood, their interests and what they were good at, what they could do and what they enjoyed. And crucially, it was about creating reciprocal peer-like support. One care home director said, it just felt like any social occasion, party friends enjoying themselves, no distinction between those who were experiencing dementia and their carers. So there was a, a, an equalizing uh, removal of any power distinction and reciprocity, giving and taking was key. In terms of the outcomes of resilience, um, the interventions improved quality of life, increased empowerment, positivity, independence, self-esteem and self-worth. One person said, I felt less like complaining and more inclined towards positive planning and living one day at a time. Thanks so much, Sally. And look, I know it's really difficult when, when these things happen. So, so well done for persevering. It was very interesting to hear your findings. Um, so we might turn to a question and answer session now. Um, um, I might ask, start off and ask Cloda a question, if, if that was okay. Um, Cloda, I'd love to just learn a bit more about how to use the, the guidelines um, that, that you created with the Irish Dementia Working Group and with Fiona. Um, 
you know, would it be a case of downloading them and just reading through them beforehand or do you have any particular suggestions? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because sometimes if you decide, okay, I'm going to involve people living with dementia in my work, it can seem a bit overwhelming. So the guidelines are definitely um, a, a support and a guide. And I would suggest if you're starting a project and you want to involve people living with dementia, just read the guidelines first of all, read them right through, think about the principles, think about applying the principles to your work. And I, I think, you know, Fiona said it in um, when she was speaking that a lot of them aren't really, you, you know, complex things. They're just putting something in your mind in terms of an approach. And I think the principles about upholding someone's personhood are really important. And sometimes all of us as professionals are guilty of thinking we know best. And I think Fiona would agree with me that as we went on the journey of developing Hear Our Voice, we found out really that the people living with dementia knew best because they had been through it. They had been, they'd gone to a conference where they weren't supported or they'd attended the, you know, a steering group meeting or a policy consultation and it was stressful. So we understood, I suppose they thought us what didn't work so that we could write down what did work. And the Irish Dementia Working Group has been going since 2013. And this was a real moment because they said, right, you know, we've, we've, we've learned the lessons the hard way. Now we hope nobody else has to learn those lessons. And I think um, having Fiona's expertise and using the, the deep guidelines really um, our former chair, Kathy Ryan, always says that she she won't be part of anything that reinvents the wheel. You know, the wheel is already there. We should all be using it. So I think I, I think that's true of these guidelines as well. We used mm. knowledge and information that was already there. And also we, we really want people to use them. You know, Fiona said it at the end of her presentation. They're there. We want you can find them on the Center for Economic and Social Research website. You can find it on the Alzheimer's Society website. And we would really encourage people to use them and just start involving people living with dementia. Yeah. And they're very brief. You know, I mean, we deliberately set out to keep it very tight, very practically focused. So it's, it's things, what things, what do you need to think about? if you want yes. to involve people with dementia, you know, and so it's not going to take you hours to read them. And it's quite, uh, quite a quick read. <laughs> yeah, And I think that's so important because like, it is a scary thing to say, right, I'm going to do this. I really don't want to do it wrong. I really don't want to annoy anyone. I really don't want any criticism. So having those there to be able to say, right, this is how I should approach this is such a help because it can be scary definitely particularly if you don't really know a person living with dementia or you haven't met that many people you you don't know what to do and i think it's really clear from you know from the working group from what margarita is saying what you're all saying is it's not about being critical it's about being supportive so we can all work together to to achieve um you know better policy better conferences better experience for the person living with dementia but also a better experience for policymakers or, or for whoever might be involving someone. So they're, they're really, really interesting. So I would definitely recommend for everyone to go and have a look at them. Certainly. Um, do we have any more questions popping in? While we're just waiting, I might just ask one more and then I promise I'll stop. Um, Cloda, if I wanted to work with members of the Irish Dementia Working Group, how do I, how do, I do that? Um, so uh, there's a, um, a really easy process. You can email advocacy at alzheimer.ie. We have a request for engagement form. So maybe, you know, you're a researcher in the audience or a policymaker or, you know, so it's important to understand the difference. So if you're a researcher, we have a dementia research advisory team who can involve, um, who, who can support you in, in PPI in your research. But if you have a policy consultation, a steering group, you want someone to speak publicly, speak to healthcare professionals, you just fill in the form. Marguerite and her colleagues will work with me to decide whether they're going to accept the engagement. And I suppose that's the one final point that I, I would like to, to make, that the, the Irish Dementia Working Group work, it's not tokenism. So I will bring the request to Marguerite and her colleagues and I will say, do you want to do this? In the same way that the idea for the guidelines was their idea. And, you know, we, we have one of our members who is really um, active politically. He supports our political advocacy. So it's, 
it's real. And, and I think that's, that's a very important point to understand. If you want to involve people living with dementia, please come to us, but please know that it's, it's not tokenism. And as, as much as possible, whether it's research with the Dementia Research Advisory Team or policy with the working group, involve people from the start. That's, that's the big thing, come as early as possible. Oh, thanks, Colo. It's really helpful. So yeah, advocacy mm -hmm. at alzheimer.ie if you'd like to involve someone in, in advocacy related work and research at alzheimer.ie if it's research specific work. But if you end up sending it to the wrong email, that's okay. I'm, I'm sure it can be ironed out on the other side, definitely. So um, there's, there's a question that's come in from chat now for Charlotte. Charlotte, did you find in terms of positive psychology that those living with dementia were much the same as any specific group when it came to indicators of positive psychology? Oh, that, that's a really good question. It's quite hard to make specific comparisons because obviously these measures were developed specifically for um, people living with dementia. So um, you know, the definitions were how we define independence, engagement, hope, resilience was very much dependent on what the people with dementia we had in the study said. Having said that, they were very high. Um, people involved in the study, those 225 people, the average, um, uh, the, the mean was very high. I can't remember exactly what it was off the top of my head, um, but it was, um, yeah, it, it was really high. So people living with dementia who were taking part in the study had quite high levels of hope, resilience, independence and engagement. Very good. So let me see. So if there's, if anybody else has got an additional question, please put it into the chat. And then are there any more questions on the panel? We'll give it one minute. <laughs> Actually, we're within the time, which is great. So while we're doing that, I'm just going to put up a poll. So this is obviously the, for the attendees to let us know how you guys are rating the session. So we'd really appreciate it if you can give us some feedback. Oh, getting very good feedback from everybody. We'll just give that a second. So um, I just want to thank everybody who's attended today's session, especially thanks to all the speakers. I found it very interesting and I'm sure everybody else did who attended as well. If there's additional questions after the session, um, people can put it in the chat. I'm gonna leave the chat open for five minutes and then I can get it to the correct person. Um, please remember that there's additional sessions for the rest of the day. Make avail of those and attend the sessions that sound interesting to you. And you can also join our conversation on Twitter at engaging EEM or, and, and if you are, please use the, our, our Twitter handle for the conference, which is hashtag dementia on 20. Um, so that's it for the day. Oh, just a second. Are there more questions? Nope, just some compliments in the in the chat, which I'll share with the panelists later. So thank you everybody for joining today and hope to see you in the rest of the sessions the rest of the day. And I was gonna say thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. 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 Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.